Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 259. Do or do not. There is no try. Yoda. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to a special crossover edition of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Known is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley ADR and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Now, before we get into it today, guys, i like to apologize for being late this week. I am actually moving offices and headquarters for Indie Film Hustle, so it's been a little bit nuts. So in the middle of a major move, it's tough to get these podcasts out. So I'm back, and today we are doing a special crossover edition of the Indie Film Hustle podcast and the Bulletproof Screenplay podcast because I felt that today's guest kind of crosses over a little bit into both worlds. So today's guest is Michael Tucker from Lessons from the Screenplay. Now, Lessons from the Screenplay is a YouTube channel that analyzes movie scripts to examine exactly how and why they are so good at telling their stories. And Michael's been doing this for a a little while now, and I have become a big, big, big fan of his channel. I wanted to have him on the show because he has learned a tremendous amount about how a lot of these, some of the best stories out there are broken down and, and how they work and why they work. He's really beaten them up a lot. And I think there's a lot of value in what he does on his channel. And I wanted to have him on the show to kind of figure out what his story was as well as um, see if we can get some knowledge bombs dropped on on the storytelling process. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Michael Tucker from Lessons from the Screenplay. How you doing, brother? Uh, I'm good. Good. Nice to see you or they, hear you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show, man. I am a huge fan of what you do over at Lessons from uh, the Screenplay, man. It is uh, it is very inspiring and, and extremely helpful to all of us screenwriters out there. So thank you for the, for the, the work, the God's work that you're doing, sir. <laughs> well, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad people are enjoying it and finding it valuable. Now, why did you, uh, why did you want to become a, a screenwriter in the first place? Well, I've pretty much always loved filmmaking. Like since I was a little kid, I remember watching Star Wars and just like having the thought of like, I want to do this. And so I've, um, yeah, since I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to get into filmmaking uh, in some respect. Mm -hmm. And at first it was, I wanted to blow up X-Wings because that just looked like so much fun. Obviously. Uh, But as I, right. (laughs) Um, But as I got older, I sort of uh, realized that, the reason I was excited about those X-Wings blowing up is because of the story around it and that like filmmaking is storytelling. And so that's when I sort of got more into wanting to be a director. And so a lot of my attention to writing came kind of through the lens of wanting to be a director. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to direct something, you have to have something to direct. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where all of my, uh, writing aspirations came from is like, how do I create the best screenplay for me to then turn into a movie? Because that's the part that I love and I have a lot of fun with. So that was sort of the the beginning of my journey into writing and filmmaking. Now, what is the genesis of Lessons from a Screenplay? At what point did you say, you know what, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and I'm going to do this? 
<laughs> yeah, so I have been in LA since 2010, uh, and I came down and I did a bunch of short films and worked with friends on creative projects, and it was really great and learned a lot, but quickly realized that short films do not pay the bills. <laughs> uh, and so then I spent a lot of time doing like documentary editing or just shooting random, uh, you know, going on random shoots and stuff. Um, and so 20, at, at the beginning of 2016, I was working on a documentary project, um, that was going to sort of pay for my life for the next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it all of a sudden got cut short and it was like literally within 24 hours and went from I'm employed for the year to it's all over. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, and so I sort of found myself, uh, suddenly without, any obligations and had been working enough to have saved up a bit mm -hmm. sort of for the first time since being in LA. And so I had this free time and I had this little bit of cushion. And so my thought process was like, okay, why don't I use this time to go back to focusing on creative stuff and uh, sort of where I'd left off in my creative journey was realizing that my, the writing side of my skill set was sort of the weakest link. Mm -hmm. Um, like I directed lots of shorts and a web series and stuff. And generally feedback was like the directing's good. It feels like a movie, but the story is kind of weak. Mm -hmm. And so with this free time, I decided, okay, I'm going to just dive into screenwriting and relearn all the basics and, uh, kind of dive into those fundamentals that I probably rushed through too much when I was in film school. And so I started reading a bunch of screenplays. And then as I was reading them, I thought, well, maybe I can write a blog post for each screenplay that I write. And that will help me retain the information that I learn. And then also can I can share it with people and maybe they'll find it valuable and it can become a thing. Mm -hmm. And so in the process of writing that first blog post, I was thinking like, well, actually, I think this could probably be a video. And, you know, I'd followed Nerdwriter and Every Frame of Painting and had seen sort of video essays and was a big fan of the educational side of YouTube with like SciShow and Vsauce and CGP Grey and stuff. So as I was writing that blog post, I was like, okay, well, I think this could be a video. And I think I, you know, I have the skill set that I think I could make this happen. Uh, so why don't I try that? And so that was kind of the inception of the original idea of the channel. Now, when you started the channel, uh, I'm assuming it did, did it take off right away or did it, did it take a little time to kind of get, get its feet, you know, get it, get its feet underneath itself. It actually took off right away, which I was pretty surprised about. Um, I spent a lot of time preparing before releasing the first video. Um, I think there's probably two or three months where it was just me brainstorming, like, what is the channel? What does the video look like? Uh, my first video, which is the Gone Girl video, mm -hmm. um, don't underestimate the screenwriter. I think I did somewhere between like five and seven versions of that video before arriving at the one that I uploaded because I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was doing when it came time to launch the channel. And so part of that was figuring out what is my voice, what is the thing that I want to say about screenwriting, what is already out there, how can I add to the conversation and not just you know, copy somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and then that all kind of culminated. I'd, I'd done the gone girl video and my independence day video, which is the second video mm -hmm. before releasing. Um, but yeah, the, on the first day that I released the gone girl video, I think it got 200,000 views. How, it, how did that happen? That doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah. I mean, it was incredibly lucky. I think, I mean, I, it was, it was largely just due to Reddit. Like I, I posted uh, it to Reddit and it happened to take off and get traction there. Sure. And so, yeah, within the first day or two, probably it was at 200,000 views. And I think at the end of the first day at 8,000 subscribers. So in one day going from zero to 8,000, you know, that was crazy. So that's insane. it was a really good sign because, it, you know, putting aside life for three months and saying like, maybe I'm going to be become a YouTuber and that's going to be my career <laughs> right. uh, is kind of a risky thing. So it, it was definitely affirming when the first video like, you know, caught some attention. It was like, okay, cool. I think maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe this can be a thing. So how, how long does it take you to do a typical episode nowadays? Um, the average I would say is about three weeks. Um, and it's, it's interesting because no two uh, videos are the same and, each one has different challenges. And over time, 
I've gotten faster, but then that also allows me to work on other projects and develop new ideas. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, at the same time. So generally my release schedule has been about one a month um, with yeah, each one taking about three weeks to make with like a week of research, a week of writing, and then a week of kind of post-production on it. Now you are an editor by trade as well, correct? Or you do that as well? Yeah, but most of my like professional gigs have been in the editing realm. That is why these videos look as slick as they do. <laughs> I mean, ser- yeah, because certainly I'll, has helped. Yeah, because I see some of these these video essays, and you're like, "Ooh, that was an iMovie, wasn't it? <laughs> Is that a Star Wipe?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that when I first had the idea, and I was like trying to do the crazy test of like, this seems like it's crazy. Are there reasons why it isn't crazy to do this? And one of the things was like, I kind of realized I had a very nice, well-rounded skill set for it. Like I knew After Effects and motion graphics and editing and had, you know, I know writing and I've made films and so all that. It seemed like I had the things that I needed to make it happen. So it was, it looked out that way. Now you've covered David Fincher's films more than any other director. Is that, uh, is that a purposeful? <laughs> um, I, I don't know that it was conscious, but it's, Definitely because Fincher is my favorite director, and I think <laughs> his his films have, are some of my favorite films. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't I didn't sit down and say I'm gonna like do Fincher films more than any other, but right. they get requested a lot, and they're some of my favorites. So it has worked out that way. Yeah. What are some of the biggest mistakes uh, screenwriters make that you've seen in your journey through lessons of a screenplay? Um, that's a good question. I mean. Kind of because of the nature of the channel, I've pretty much only read really good screenplays. Um, <laughs> sure. But um, but from your experience in general, what do you think some of the big mistakes that you've made personally uh, when writing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, so sort of like I was saying, I, I kind of came at screenwriting from a director standpoint. Mm-hmm. And when I make my videos, I'm often picturing as the audience, me in film school, like you know, film school, Michael, who was really into directing. And, and I think it's easy to get excited about the clever ideas or like, you know, this twist is going to be so cool or like memento where like half of it's told backwards. Like I like stories like that. I don't like normal stories where it's just a normal character arc and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I think that's something that I found in myself and other people I saw when I was in film school is getting excited about, the clever high concept stuff and skipping past the very fundamental basics. Like what is, what is a simple character arc? Like how do you design like a normal conventional structured film? Uh, What can you learn from that? That then lets you, you know, play with those conventions later. But it's just kind of that, that old adage of like learn the rules before you break them. So you know how to break them in intelligent ways. And I think that's something that, I think a lot of aspiring filmmakers do um, is <laughs> yes. try to rush past the the basics that make people care about that clever twist that you have in mind for right. the end of the film. I just want to eat the cake. I don't want to make it. Right. <laughs> exactly. I don't want to know all the nuances about how to actually put the ingredients <laughs> together. What what fun is that? <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, um, in in general, um, do you struggle more with writing plot, character, structure, or or all three or combination? Because <laughs> I have my um, I have my answers to that. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, it's uh, I think a lot of it is character. I mean, I definitely try to approach whatever I'm writing, you, you know, keeping in mind that all of those aspects need to be connected. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I'm maybe just because I've spent so much time editing, I think I'm much better at taking pieces that are laid out on the table and Mm -hmm. putting them together in the proper way than I am generating new ideas from scratch. And so I think for me, a lot of it is, you know, probably in the character realm of like, I know I can figure out the structure and like these beats need to happen and these character changes need to occur at this point, you know, for the optimal, you know, dramatic impact. But when it comes to figuring out the specifics of that character, 
uh, that can be tricky for me because it, it, that's when it kind of gets into a realm of like, well, there are tons of things that could satisfy, you know, the needs of the story. So how do I decide the right one? And how do I make sure that like this choice also meshes with this other character choice? And so I feel like that that can be uh, a part where I, I spend a lot of time running around in my brain, frustrated, trying to figure out the best way. Now, are there any tips on how you can evoke emotion uh, in in a in a story in a screen in a screenplay? You know, I think one of my videos that I talked about was um, in Game of Thrones and sort of how they evoke emotion. And I think from a structural point of view, I think they're very good about making sure every scene has a that sort of transition of values that McKee talks about, where mm-hmm. you know the beginning of the scene everybody's happy at the end of the scene, everybody's sad, like making sure that there are significant, you know, value changes happening uh, on a scene level and on a sequence level uh, and on, you know, the greater story level. And I think that um, is definitely key. I think the films where I find myself kind of getting bored or not as engaged are the ones where it seems like things are going fine for too long and there aren't those big changes. Mm -hmm. And when I, you know, read either like friends scripts or sort of, you know, people, you know, aspiring writer scripts, that is something that I see a lot too, is like scenes and sequences that are there just to get from point A to point B, but they're not, they don't have those turns. They're not really telling the story. They're just moving the plot forward. And so I think that's kind of one of the disciplines you have to internalize is, you know, making sure a scene isn't there just to get the characters made to be, but like, what is the lesson they're learning? How is each scene and sequence pushing them further on their character arc? And I think that's why writing is so hard because you have to do so many things it, at once. Exactly. It is. There is a lot of yeah. plates you're spinning, uh, especially. Since, yeah. and, and you look at some of these complex films that have um, so many things going on. And some of these writers just do it so effortless, uh, effortlessly, and you're just like, God damn it, mm-hmm. man, how the hell are they doing <laughs> this? Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to geek out a little bit with you, uh, considering that The yeah. Avengers was just recently released. Did you see it yet? Yes, I did. We won't talk about it. No spoilers. Um, okay. But why why is Marvel getting it right and DC getting it so wrong? <laughs> In your opinion, because I know you did a Marvel uh, episode or an Avengers episode specifically, um, what is it about, uh, in your opinion, that Marvel's done so wonderfully right? Whether you like them or not, for whatever reason, they are successful. Where mm-hmm. DC seems to be floundering so badly. Yeah, I mean, I think it it, w- it was really interesting doing my Avengers video because I went and rewatched almost all of the Marvel films. And it was interesting seeing the progression that happened, like going back to the original Iron Man, which I loved when it came out. Um, It also, it's weird watching it now because it feels kind of outside the kind of model that Marvel has arrived at Mm -hmm. um, at the same time. And I think probably a lot of it is that DC is trying to do a lot of catch up. I think like they were trying to jump too far ahead especially i mean i haven't seen justice league but oh my I feel God. Like i've it's, seen it's, enough it's, it's just to know. you don't need to watch it it is the most atrocious thing you've ever watched right. it's so bad <laughs> <laughs> i watched it just because i wanted to see the car crash i wanted to see the car crash and, mm. I, and it was absolutely the car crash and then some it was oh sorry oh, <laughs> that's yeah there's oh, and you know the and funny this is why and you know the funny thing is mm-hmm. you can actually tell scenes that joss wheaton wrote like I could be like, oh, that's Joss Wheaton right there. Like, oh, there's that scene. It was like, that's way too fun and clever <laughs> for it not to be Joss Wheaton. And right. it was. And you could just tell the moments that Josh put in because they are those Marvel moments. Not enough to save it by any stretch because the structure was all off and, and, and the background of the characters mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But you could tell the mm-hmm. individual little scenes that they're just – little gems but there's not enough for the movie but but you could tell to save it not enough to save it but you could so tell (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's funny yeah i I mean i think what's also interesting about dc is i think they were trying to kind of ride the wave of the dark knight which was sort of this like it's it's an anomaly (laughs) right and and i think what was great about it was that it was kind of a darker take on a superhero film and it was very grounded in reality and it was sort of like a post-terrorism commentary about like there was a lot of things happening in mm-hmm. that that was really good but i feel like it was kind of the exception to the rule and i feel like they tried to then 
kind of paint everything in that same color. And I think it just, it, it doesn't seem like, uh, I don't know, like a tone and a style that superhero films want to live in, or at least. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Not bad. I, I don't know. I think Marvel has found <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I feel like Marvel has found their tone uh, and their voice really well. And uh, you know, having seen Infinity War and sort of the more recent films, I, I am really amazed that each film, you know, in some ways, it's it, it can feel cookie cutter because you go in knowing what to expect and you get exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. But that's also really impressive. And I think they know their audience really well and have found their sort of formula that also lets different directors come in and play and do sort of their own take. Like, you know, Thor had a lot of personality and guardians and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I think the, the focus seems to be on like the, the characters and the humor and making sure people are having fun with the characters and I think that, especially in Infinity War, again, I'm not going to spoil anything, but of that course. was uh, something that that stood out to me is like they're they're making sure that we're having fun when we're watching these films. And I think not every film needs to be fun in the same way. Mm -hmm. But like I remember watching Batman versus Superman and just being Ooh. like just wanting to tear my hair out. And like, <laughs> why? <laughs> Why, just why? Just why, why are you making me watch this? Yeah, like the, there's clever idea. Like even if the, the story and the elements are interesting, like having interesting stuff isn't enough. Like it has to be compelling and people have to be emotionally involved and all. That. I think that I think there was so much. I haven't quite figured out how to do that. I th yeah, I think that DC had so much fear. I, honestly, I believe it's fear of being left behind, which they already are. They're they're comp they mm -hmm. got Marvel's got a ten year jump on them. So mm -hmm. rather than try to compete, just the the, the road the roadmap's been laid out. They could have easily brought in Aquaman. What well, they did wonderful wonderful job with Wonder Woman. I thought that was that's the, one of the mm -hmm. highlights. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and 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 they could have brought Aquaman in. They could have brought in the Flash and did the same thing they did with Avengers, and then and then at the end bring in Justice League, and then you know then slowly mm -hmm. bring in Martian Manhunter, and because they have great characters. But they're just, mm -hmm. I don't know what the hell they're thinking. <laughs> but yeah. I, but we don't need, we don't need a brooding Superman. I just, I, Superman's not a brooding character. Right. Or like, like don't have that be like his defining quality. Like maybe that's, you know, the dark part of like one of the films is he like doubts things, but like he still has to, I think that that was something that I really liked about Wonder Woman is I left feeling like I really knew what Wonder Woman stood for. Yes. Like intellectually and emotionally. I was like, oh, okay, she is a superhero that stands for this. Mm -hmm. And I get it and I'm on board and that's great. And I feel like I never got that from Batman or Superman or the other DC characters. Ugh, and then they just, just jammed them all in there at the end. Anyway, we could go on yeah. for hours talking about DC <laughs> and Marvel. Um, but yeah. there was another video you did that I found riveting, which was the Rogue One versus Force Awakens. Uh, mm -hmm. with the two leads and, and and you're comparing the two i i know you're a star wars fan because there's a lightsaber on your on your icon uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which is quite nice by the way i need you to do one of those for me <laughs> um and uh so i know you've you're a big fan of star wars uh and i'm sure you've seen all of them and now we're in mm -hmm. in, in the golden age if you will of star wars films because now they're just coming in every year hopefully the quality <laughs> right. will will continue uh, mm -hmm. moving forward uh, what was your can you just talk to the audience a little bit about your take between Rogue One and Force Awakens and the two leads and how they differed uh, so so much but yet they kind of didn't it all de you know depends on your point of view sure yeah uh, it's funny because after I release a video my brain immediately like forgets everything uh, <laughs> that, I, that I talked about so it's going to take me a minute to load it back up but, but I, I remember watching uh, the force awakens and just kind of like falling in love with the Ray character because yeah, I feel sure. like it was just a very well rendered uh, character where you understood her background. You understood kind of what she wanted and it was just, you know, fun to see her be put in these situations mm -hmm. at least for like the first half of the film. Mm -hmm. And 
I remember watching Rogue One and just feeling like bored the whole time. And like, I didn't understand who Jin was. Like you see the, the opening scene, you know, you see her backstory and I feel like that was really good, but you don't really get to see who she is in the present. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was sort of what that video was about was like how to uh, kind of define your protagonist and make them an active protagonist and how important that is. And I think that was the main thing that was missing for me in Rogue One was Jin doesn't really make any choices. Like right. ostensibly she's the protagonist of the film, but she's pretty much along for the ride or she's given choices that aren't really choices. It's like, do this or you die. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I well, guess we're going to do, do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and making choices, that's, that's how you define the protagonist. That's how you learn what they care about. And, I feel like she just wasn't given many opportunities to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I feel like that's why she was not a compelling uh, protagonist for me. Even though I like I love the actress, I feel like the performance was great. It's just there wasn't a whole lot of character development there for her or really any of the other characters, I thought. Um, but Force Awakens. And I feel like. In Force Awakens, she was more of a, an active protagonist. Yeah, I think, you know, for especially for the first half of the film, you kind of see her day to day life and you see her make choices like she's going to save BB-8 and she's not going to like sell him to the drunk trader. And it's like those are like little things and maybe they're kind of obvious things, but they're at least that helps you understand who they are and gives you information so that later when they're forced with more difficult choices, you kind of know where they're coming from. And so you understand why that's a difficult choice and it's more compelling that way now what do you agree with i mean obviously force awakens is similar in structure to new hope um if i remember the video correctly you gave a good explanation why you felt that they went down that road um yeah it's funny i can't remember that specific point but that that's definitely something you know people say a lot and i think there it is it is definitely similar to a new hope i think that was intentional Mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of those elements are kind of universal elements Mm -hmm. um but i I feel like for as many similarities as there were it didn't really bother me because it felt like there were a lot of new things that they were doing Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. um like the introduction of the Finn character was a cool, you know, new take on what a Star Wars character is like getting to know a stormtrooper. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of time with Kylo Ren and, you know, get to know him as a character far more than you do Darth Vader in the original. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so I've, I feel like there was the it did have kind of the same big beats. And I'm in agreement that like if there's another Death Star at any point, I'm just gonna like quit because like they need to <laughs> they need to stop having Death Stars, or um, or in Marvel or, or any superhero movie, uh, the villain be a cloud in the sky that's uh, destroying right, the everything. blue light beam. Yes, the blue light yeah, beam in right. the sky. It's a Suicide Squad run. I'm like, you guys gotta be kidding me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I remember thinking that too. I was like, wait, really? Like <laughs> you've done that so many times now. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, uh, now, la- right. la- now last yeah. thing on the star Wars, uh, on the star Wars uh, front, mm-hmm. last Jedi. What thoughts, mm-hmm. thoughts, critiques, comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to dive into it too much because sure. I may or may not be working on a new video that will go into that oh, uh, awesome. in more detail. Good. Awesome. Um, that should do well. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hope, hopefully it, I will probably end up angering one half of the internet, you know, one that's, way or another, or both. But that's, but that's for you with everything, isn't it? I mean, anything you put out, you're going to piss yeah. somebody off. It's true. But yeah, my sort of overview with The Last Jedi, I think, is I, I really like the things that they went for and that they attempted to do. And I think I liked all of the Ray Kylo Ren, Luke forced storyline stuff. Mm-hmm. I thought that was an interesting addition to the Star Wars universe that wasn't just like replaying, you know, the original trilogy over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like the the Finn, Rose, Poe storylines, while intellectually interesting, and again, I, I like what they were going for, it was not very fun to watch. And I feel like <laughs> it was not <laughs> executed in a way that... that um, that made the things they were trying to accomplish resonate with me anyway. Mm -hmm. So I I have sort of like a, a love hate relationship with the film where there are parts where I feel like it's has things that 
I think are really important to bring to the Star Wars saga and in some ways I think does those things better than maybe any of the films. And then there are other parts that are like prequel level. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Like why? Ooh, that's, those are, those, why are, are, those are fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> Prequel levels. How dare you, sir? No, I'm joking. <laughs> See, this, yeah. Just can't win. Can't win with Star Wars. No, it's it's true. And but you know, I think that movie will age well. I think I think in five or ten I years, so I, I think it'll age better than the I think the prequels have gotten worse with age. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I remember when I first saw Phantom Menace, I thought, oh my God, this was awesome when I first saw it, but also mm-hmm. I was starving for a Star Wars movie and Darth Maul was the greatest character the Star Wars had ever created at the right. time. But I double bladed lightsaber. What I, else do you want? I mean, he's got horns. Come on. <laughs> and I recently watched it with my my six year old daughter, and I and I just was in shock at how horribly bad it was. <laughs> like the story structure, yeah. the characters, the dialogue. I was uh-huh. just like, oh my god, did I like this? It's kind of like going back to the eighties and watching a John Claude Van Damme movie. Like, because mm. <laughs> <laughs> at the time it was like the greatest thing ever, but now not so much. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think it'll also be interesting. I think episode nine and what they choose to do with episode nine yes. will probably affect the perception of eight. Cause I feel like they can either kind of double down and keep going hard in that same direction, or they could try to walk it back and do another JJ Force Awakens kind of lighter, fun take on the ending. I think JJ's and well, I feel that's, like JJ's there, so I think that might be where it goes. Yeah, and that's kind of kind of worried about that. So it'll be interesting to see what what happens. And uh, when are we ever going to get an Old Republic trilogy? I want an Old Republic, mm. trilogy, right? Am I- that's cool. I mean, maybe that's what Ryan Johnson's working on. He said he's not. He said specifically he's not. Oh, okay. But we'll see. Oh, okay. We'll see. Right. Um, so, uh, sorry, guys. We just had to, I had to go down. I had to geek out with Michael <laughs> about this because, you know, I wanted to hear his thoughts. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, let me ask you. You've read a tremendous amount of screenwriting books because I know you refer to many of them um, throughout mm-hmm. your, your, um, your videos. What is your favorite screenwriting book? And which one would you, if you had to buy one for, if you're a screenwriter and you're going to buy one, which are they? Which is it? That's actually a really hard question. I mean, I think. Okay. Three my, books, three books, three books. Okay. That make, so, so my answer is going to be the anatomy of story by John Truby, which is yep. probably my most used book. Yep. Um, but I, I think the reason I like that one so much is because I've read the others and I think it kind of added a missing piece for me. And so I think Story by Robert McKee is sort of, of course. the counterpart to that in my head mm-hmm. of just like these are the, the fundamentals there. Um, and then recently I've been uh, reading John York's book, Into the Woods, a five act journey into structure mm-hmm. or into story. Um, and it kind of covers a lot of the the same things that sort of the older screenwriting books, uh, you know, like the writer's journey by Christopher Vogler and like mm-hmm. sort of all those things it, it talks about and then makes commentary on and sort of updates them in ways that I find interesting. Mm-hmm. So I think those are the three, uh, that have really resonated with me. And I feel like that's kind of my litmus test for screenwriting books. Cause I think in a lot of ways they're all talking about the same thing. Sure. And so I think it's about finding the one or two that, click with you and make you go, Oh, I get it. Like this, this resonates with me. I understand how to internalize this and actually apply it. Now, how has uh, lessons from a screenplay helped you as a screenwriter and as a filmmaker? Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's opened my eyes to all, all the things that I was doing wrong. Um, <laughs> I, I think it as I think the most valuable thing is it's made me appreciate those fundamentals. Um, sort of like how I was talking earlier, you know, film school, me just wanted to like be creative and like, I don't want to follow the rules. I want to do something interesting and like not cookie cutter. And I think I've come to appreciate that story as we know it anyway, as, as our culture and our society is kind of, based on a formula and it's there for a reason. Like there is a psychological reason that we respond to things that are told 
in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've come to appreciate that and value the importance of that and structure and character arcs and all those, those fundamentals. And then that has also helped me appreciate even more stories that either, you know, do their own twist on them and Mm -hmm. kind of turn our expectations on their head or films that follow them to a T, but do it in a way that still feels really fresh and engaging. Like I'm, I'm as impressed by people that can do everything conventionally and have it still be, you know, an exciting film experience as I am people that can break the rules and create that same kind of effect. Very cool. Uh, now, can you discuss a little bit about uh, your Patreon and what is Patreon in, in general? Sure. So Patreon, I kind of describe it as kind of like Kickstarter. It's people know Kickstarter. It's sort of like an ongoing Kickstarter. So you can go on Patreon and pledge uh, a certain amount to a creator that you follow on like an ongoing basis. So my Patreon, you could go on and pledge, you know, $3 per video that I release. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a way to help uh, for you to help the creators you like make their creations sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, so my Patreon, um, they're sort of like Kickstarter. They're different tiers with different perks. And so there's uh, the $1 tier where you get to uh, know ahead of time what film I'm working on for the next video. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a $3 tier where I release like extra content where I sort of talk about, you know, another thing I love about the film and it's just sort of like a short video that I make just for patrons. Um, there's a $5 tier where you get early access. You get to see the videos before they go live. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, a $10 tier, which is really fun where you can, um, join like a Google hangout. Like we have a monthly Google hangout where me and all the patrons like talk about movies that we've seen (laughs) or like discuss the latest video. And that's actually, I was kind of nervous about putting that up because I wasn't sure what, what that experience would be like, but it's actually been a really great getting to know some of my patrons really well and talking about our favorite films and just having really cool discussions. So, awesome. uh, so yeah, so those are the, the different rewards available on my Patreon. Very cool. And, uh, yeah. And, and it, like $2 doesn't sound a lot, but when you get a thousand or 2000 people, then all of a sudden. Yeah. And, and what I love about it is that it, it, it really is freeing because my videos don't have to like live or die by how many views they get mm-hmm. on YouTube. And so like, that helps resist the urge to do like clickbaity titles or like try to dumb down my content to reach a wider, wider audience. It's Patreon is really great at enabling creators to make the authentic content that they want to make. That's why you haven't done a Marvel versus DC one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, do we need another one of those? I don't know. You know. I actually accidentally did one of those when I was interview. I was doing a consulting session with, uh, with a filmmaker and he asked me and I'm like, shit, all right, let's do this. And I, I laid in 15, 20 minutes and then I popped it up on my YouTube channel just for fun. I, mm-hmm. I swear to God, it got like 20,000 views. Oh, man. Yeah. For, and I'm like, really? <laughs> really? There's so many other good things on this channel. This is the one. Right. It is so, fr- and it is frustrating because that's sort of how my, my Star Wars video is also that way. And it's kind of the one negative video that I've done where I'm kind of like criticizing the films. Sure. And it's kind of unfortunate that I think like criticism creates more like stirs people up more so they share it more and like debate about it more and that helps the algorithm and stuff and it's i try not to like feed into that side of the internet because i feel like there's too much of that so i try to be constructive with my my videos you are actually you are actually you are fairly because i think you're right the star wars is the only one that you're actually kind of like downing of something that you were covering generally you're you're uplifting uh and saying what they did right as opposed to what they did wrong yeah Cool. Yeah, I hope I, that's my goal with each one. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, what okay. advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Um, get really good. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> you are a sage, <laughs> sir. Is... You are a sage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a genius. Clearly, you're a genius. Um, <laughs> but but I, I think that has in my kind of somewhat limited experience you know, interacting with the industry. I I think there is something to just being like undeniably good at what you do. And I think a lot of people trying to break into the film business, um, 
yeah, I kind of jump several steps ahead of like, I need an agent and I need to do this and got to like this one screenplay I have, is going to sell and I'm going to make it and all this stuff. And I think it's much more helpful to practice a lot, write a lot, make a bunch of stuff. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So that you build up your skill set. So when you do have that opportunity, you're able to really capitalize it, capitalize on it, or in the meantime, make your own opportunities because you know how to create good stuff. So I think that's sort of my, in my experience, what's helped me is like, rather than getting like tunnel visioned on this one thing, put that thing aside, work on another thing, create another thing, put it out there, work with people. And I think the more you keep yourself going, that attracts other people that want to keep going. And eventually you build something that breaks through to the next level. Very cool. Now, what is the book? Uh, tell me the book that, that had the biggest impact on your life or career. I think, uh, I think it is John Truby's The Anatomy of Story. Yeah. Because I think that was the screenwriting book that, like I said, it really like clicked for me and all of the sort of Robert McKee like arcs and graphs and like that mm-hmm. intellectual side of things. I think McKee explained it in a way that felt very organic and actionable and just really resonated with me and kind of finally opened that door for me to enter and appreciate those sort of fundamentals of storytelling. Now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, um, hmm. I think uh, the creative self-discipline, I think, is hard. And I sort of yeah. have mentioned that before. But, um, yeah, knowing, like, knowing the difference between you're just excited about an idea versus, mm-hmm. like, is that idea good and like (laughs) (laughs) i think in the past i've had ideas you know like me 10 years ago if i'd had the idea for lessons from the screenplay i probably would have just written a video and made it and uploaded my first version and just sort of dove in and gotten to the fun part and i think what i learned over my time in la and working all these other projects and stuff was that it's good to put in the the work needed before you get to that fun part like that discipline is the thing that will let you uh you know succeed and get to that the part that you enjoy and so i think that for lessons from screenplay like i said was a lot of research and practice and doing lots of drafts and you know not taking good enough as the final version and and really pushing myself to do that extra work and I think that is what's helped the channel become, you know, as successful as I'm lucky enough that it has been, is that putting in that extra work that I may have skipped when I was younger. Yeah. The age, there is something to age, isn't there? <laughs> there is. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's frustrating, a, but it's, it's true. <laughs> it's frustrating and there are things that are not so good with age. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, I agree with you 110. Um, percent Now, this is the probably the toughest question uh, you'll ask. You'll be asked today. Name the three favorite films of all time. Oh boy. Okay. Star Wars. Obviously. Oh, I hate this question. It's so hard. Um, it, it won't be on your tombstone. Just three that that tickle your fancy today. Okay. Star Wars, Alien, and oh man, I don't seven. Oh God. Yeah, we, we we can hang out. <laughs> seven is one of my favorite. Se- seven is one of my favorite uh, films of all time. It's on my top five as well. That and Fight Club, because I, I just love mm, love yeah. love Seven. And funny, uh, funny. I'll, I'll tell yeah. you a real quick funny story. When I saw Seven, I was in college. It was ninety five. I was in college, and I when I walked out, I, I there was a garbage can right by the ex- exit of the of the theater, and I saw film in it, and I was like, "What the hell is that?" And I op- I pull out the film and it was the trailer to Seven and I uh. literally just grabbed another bag, tossed it in the back, and I just ran out the door with it. <laughs> and it's still on That's my sh- amazing. It, it is still on my shelf today. I have a thirty five wow. millimeter print. I have never played, but I have a thirty five millimeter. And you know how I cl- I cleaned it because it was like s- soda on it and other stuff on it. I mm-hmm. put it in the, I put it in the tub. <laughs> I cleaned it with soap and water. <laughs> 
and it still it looks great. I, I hold it up and everything, and I still own the the, the trailer. Oh, One of my prized possessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's amazing that's like a priceless piece of like memorabilia that's awesome now um where can people find you um so they can find me on youtube uh the channel is lessons from the screenplay and then on twitter and instagram my handles at michael tucker la um yeah those, those are the places <laughs> michael man it has been a pleasure and an honor speaking to you sir man please continue doing the good work that you're doing and helping screenwriters and filmmakers out there with those awesome videos man thanks again awesome thank you for having me i hope you enjoyed that episode with michael thank you so much michael for coming on the show and dropping some knowledge bombs on the tribe and if you want to get links to anything we discussed in this episode just head over to indiefilmhustle.com or you can go to indiefilmhustle.com forward slash bps 022 for all the listeners over on the bulletproof screenplay podcast so i hope you guys enjoyed this crossover event i do these every few months or so every maybe month month and a half six weeks or so i try to grab an episode that i think will talk to both audiences uh both for indie film hustle podcast and the bulletproof screenplay podcast so i hope you guys are enjoying this and i have a bunch more stuff coming i just can't wait to tell you so much stuff so many things happening I can't, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm about to burst, seriously. But uh, guys, I, I really appreciate all the support. And if you haven't gone already, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. And if you're listening to Bulletproof Screenplay, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com and leave a good review for that show. We are brand new with Bulletproof Screenplay, so every review really help, helps us out a lot in the rankings. So thank you again so much for listening, guys. And as always... Keep the hustle going, keep that dream alive, and keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 